morning, this is super hot. Can you happy with your shot? Mm -hmm. Okay, had a little false start there, but you know what? I don't have a producer. I need to get a producer. Bullinator, where are you? Uh, yeah, I hope that either Dave McGinnis or Bullinator start actually producing some of these shows because I'm inept at it. I'm fully aware that I cannot produce. I tried year, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I started off doing producing. Was it my thing? This is why we actually got with Bullinator and realized that he was much better than the rest of us. Uh, matter of fact, he's almost superhuman at it. But we got started here. So today we're going to be talking about the philosophy of science. We have the, the wonderful Dr. Hugh Ross with us, if you guys remember way back when. He's actually been on my channel and other channels of ours for like, I don't know, like six times already. Um, luckily, I was able to meet him in person during the AMP convention a couple months ago that Dr. Kenny Rose invited me to, and it was brilliant. Um, I Again, uh, I'm, I'm not a theist, so I definitely don't have the same perspectives uh, as the, the people there, but I got to tell you, the conversation was just amazing. Uh, I don't think I had that much intelligent dialogue in, in real life uh, in my life, so it was definitely one of the best uh, trips that I ever went on. It was like a four-hour journey to me to get to it. But anyway, Dr. Hugh Ross, uh, if you guys don't know, he's an astronomer and best-selling author. He travels the globe speaking on the compatibility of advancing scientific theories with a timeless truth of Christianity. His organization, Reasons Believe, is dedicated to demonstrating a variety of a via a variety of resources and events that science and biblical faith are allies and not enemies, which I think is really indicative of what we're going to be talking about today of the compatibility of, of science and theology related, the guiding principles of science with philosophy, and also joined us with us today is Dr. Dr. Kroon and Dr. Griffith. So I'm going to have them actually introduce themselves real quick, and then we get right to Dr. Ross. But Dr. Griffith, for those who don't know who you are, hi, and if I can oh. tell who you are. Hi, Steve. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Misha Griffith. I'm a historian and a historian of technology. I teach at Northern Virginia Community College currently. Uh, where I mainly do survey courses, but I talk a lot about the history of science and technology. Yeah, so this is kind of right up your alley in some ways. Yeah, but I'm I'm the, I'm the junior scholar here, so so. Well, what I does that make me? <laughs> yeah, that, that really yeah, that makes my, I feel so you people don't even know how inferior I feel when I'm in a room like this. But Dr. Kroon, my friend, astrophysicist, mm -hmm. would you also like to introduce yourself if people don't know you by now, which they should, by the way. Yeah, John Crone got my PhD from George Mason University in Fairfax. Go Virginia. Patriots. Go Patriots. Um, <laughs> focusing on analytical methods to high energy astrophysics modeling, a gamma ray and X ray transients. Uh, then I did a two year postdoc at the Naval Research Lab where I furthered my dissertation research into the time domain. And I'm currently a government contractor data scientist in the DC area. Sorry, sorry about that. I had a, had a distraction there. Hey, okay, so thank you very much for that. By the way, you, you, you know, people may have not remembered, but Dr. Crew's been on our channel numerous times. Go watch those videos. They, <laughs> they had some great conversations with those, those particular episodes. Uh, but the, the star right today is Dr. Hugh Ross from Reasons to Believe. Uh, well, first, welcome back, Hugh. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I remember the first time you came on, and it was one of the best episodes that I had. had. And that was back in the day when I was just doing, like, hangouts. <laughs> you moderated that very well so thank you so i think we're going to dive into the topic uh of the philosophy of science hugh if you want to like from your perspective what you think the reasons why philosophy is a critical guiding principle to to science now i have a little blurb up here that you may not be able to see if unless you're watching the video but it it's from uh norwood hansen and it says uh, history of science without philosophy of science is blind, and philosophy of science without history of science is empty. Because I think that there's a strong correlation between the history of science relating to philosophy and philosophy as a guiding principle to the scientific methodology. So maybe from your perspective, from reasons to believe, or from theist, or even from a non-theist position, because I don't think it really makes that much difference, how do, how do you relate philosophy to science? Well, I engage a lot of philosophers and theologians, and I notice that they play turf wars, where they say, you know, philosophy is a king, it supersedes anything in theology or science. I see scientists saying the same thing, uh, that science trumps everything, and likewise theologians, the queen of the sciences. 
And from my personal perspective, you can't separate them. They need to be fully integrated. You really can't do good science without having some philosophical understanding of how you interpret the data. But likewise, I'd argue you can't do good philosophy unless you've got some appreciation that the natural world is real, uh, that it's not just simply some kind of illusion. And, uh, you know, there's something that we see in the natural realm uh, that screams consistency and harmony, and that plays right into our interpretation of what we see. So I think it's a really uh, big mistake to try to separate philosophy and science, they need to be fully integrated. And I've always argued that the same interpretive principle undergirds all three disciplines, namely the scientific method. Although my colleagues who are theologians would say, hey, it's not the scientific method, it's the biblical testing method. But the whole point is, I think we get a successful integration when we're using a common interpretive method. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of I'm going to kind of turn it over to Dr. Kroon on that because, uh, as an actual scientist, I mean, Dr. Kroon is, is more of a histor historian. But from from a scientific perspective, I mean, do you think that matters uh, at all, whether it's, it's from a theist perspective or a non-theist perspective? Because I I've been to agree with what he said. Uh, to me, uh, philosophy and and science cannot be extricated from each other. They are intricately related in a very necessary type way. Yeah, there are definitely both different ways of experiencing the universe as human beings, as scientists, as believers and non-believers. There's definitely um, uh, a pervasive objective reality that I think is not mutually exclusive with the uh, theological aspect of reality as we experience it. And Dr. Griffith, do you want to weigh in as well? And by the way, I don't know who's calling me right now. I, I hear somebody calling, and I know where it's coming from. But oh well, <laughs> I get all kinds of weird messages right when I do these shows. I I think you're hearing things, Steve. I, I, no, um, <laughs> probably. Definitely, we see science and philosophy ha were tied from the very beginning. I mean, we called early scientists natural philosophers. We didn't start making that distinction until the really early 19th century with, I think it was Huxley, uh, um, uh, uh, Darwin's bulldog. Tom, Thomas Henry Huxley. He's, yeah. my, he's my guy. I'm, I'm the agnostic in the room. So yeah, I, I, I know Huxley. <laughs> so he, I, I've heard of him. Yes. So, so that, def, that distinction between science and religion, and I've, uh, Jerry and I did a show on a little bit about the myth of the flat earth. And we talked a little bit about the, that distinctive break between science and religion and where did it come from and why was it so important. But I will not say that science was separate from religion for a very long time or separate from philosophy for a very long time. Um, I think there's that critical need of science now to be objective that I think pushes it towards uh, that stern separation. Well, I, and I and I definitely agree with that. But let me ask Dr. Ross. Um, you had kind of, you kind of touched on this a little bit, and, and there's something called scientism, right? And they're actually a legitimate thing called scientism that I I, I know about. That I, I think people misuse that word. But to me, scientism is the applicate or misapplication of scientific methodology to things that are not applicable, such as philosophy. Uh, so when you mentioned a little bit earlier about, um, you know, guiding principles from a biblical type perspective for science, do you want to kind of explain that a little more detail? Because I, I, you don't advocate scientism, uh, but of course, there is such a thing as misapplying science to things like uh, maybe the Bible, maybe? Or, or in, your, in your RTB, you guys integrate them related together, correct? Yeah, and I think most people understand scientism as the idea that science is the only pathway to truth. Philosophy doesn't count. Theology doesn't count, just science. And science can answer all the questions that's important to humanity. And uh, that's basically ignoring the fact that uh, we have a non-physical component. Uh, so you run into difficulties even with science, like uh, human exceptionalism and the exceptionalism of birds and mammals relative to all their life. Uh, but yeah, what I was arguing for is that, I mean, one reason why I adopted Christianity and not Hinduism or Buddhism or one of the other world's religions is in Christianity, there's the two books doctrine. 
that there's a God that reveals himself faithfully and truthfully through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And uh, that's why I made the point that from a Christian worldview perspective, you've got the same interpretive rules working in both theology and science. It's the scientific method. And, you know, Christianity is based on the idea everything must be tested. And it must be tested in a very specific way that enables you not to get all the truth, but to be in a pathway where you can get progressively more and more close to that truth. And, you know, from a Christian worldview perspective, there's never any end to that quest for truth. I mean, we'll never know everything, either theologically, philosophically, or scientifically. Uh, but I would argue from a worldview perspective of Christianity, at least we got a methodology that ensures we're going to make progress. And, and you do hold, though, that the scientific method can be used to test some of the, the principles behind uh, what Reason to Believe stands for. Like, I've read your book on Problem and Planet, and, it, it, and it, that was one of the critical things, I think, is that you're promoting science and saying that if, we, if there is a deity of some kind, uh, there, there is ways of testing certain things, because you do promote things like intelligent design and think that they are testable models, correct? Right. I mean, uh, we founded Reasons to Believe on a testable creation model, because you know, one of the big complaints I hear from my non-theistic scientific friends, they'll say, well, creation's not testable, it's not falsifiable, it's not predictive. And I would agree with them if you're talking about other faiths, but Christianity is eminently testable, falsifiable, predictive, and that's kind of the core of what we do, is show people how to put things to the test. And that's really your guide to any scientific theory. I mean, that's how astronomy works, that's how physics works, any science works, is that we put our models to the test, and the one that's got the greatest explanatory power and predictive success isn't necessarily the correct model, but at least it's on a pathway uh, towards a correct model. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that per se, but Dr. Griffith, do you want to weigh in on that? Because I, 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 mean, I think he's kind of right on that in some ways. I, I don't know if the God claim itself is a testable hypothesis in, 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 because, it, because God could change things, making any hypothesis that you have just be invalid. But as far as some, some of the things that, are, 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 from a Christianity point of view, I think those would be testable and falsifiable. Would they not be? Uh, current science doesn't, doesn't always have the luxury of being able to test everything. Sometimes we have to wait until we have the technology that's capable of testing these things. That's a really good um, point. For example, Michael Faraday. So many of the things that he found as far as electromagnetism weren't going to become fruition, weren't going to uh, really become important and useful until people are going to find uh, various ways of testing electromagnetism and of understanding it. So. There are just too many variables out there to absolutely say this is exactly the way it is and no more. You know, that's an excellent point because, you know, falsificationism is, is a principle by Karl Popper that to be a really strong hypothesis or theory, there should be some kind of falsification criteria. But although that's not like, it has, that has to, it does not have to be the case. That is just a guiding principle that most scientists would use, but not all. Some actually argue against falsificationism. But you're right. There may be ways, not not be ways to test things. Simulation theory is a good, you know, thing that right right now we kind of know how we could maybe test for it, and they're trying to do some kind of test for it, checking the granularity of the universe. But do we really have the technology to determine either way right now? Probably not. Would you get? Dr. Kroon, do you want to weigh on that? I don't know if you know anything about simulation theory, but as far as hypotheses go, uh, do you think that, that Reasons Believe Outlook is correct on that, that they can test certain things that they do port forth in relationship to science and theology be kind of integrating with each other? Oh, yeah, I don't doubt it. I um, I, I haven't read the book yet, although it's on my, my to-read list. It's, it's actually at the top. I just didn't have time to read it before the show. Wh which book? The, um, any of Dr. Ross's. Oh, oh, I got, well, I want some, I got, I got a collection of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the way, I, I got to admit, I like the way he writes. I, know, I, I, I don't always agree with his conclusions, no offense, but it, like, for example, Improbable Planet, the science was just amazing. I mean, I think that was your, your no offense, but that's your best book. I mean, it was just so well written and good. And the argument was really good on it, even though I don't know how convincing it may be to some people, but it's a well stated argument, I think, as far as like the, the, uh, the, the, the fact that we're still here after so many 
all these improbable events happening and these these cataclysmic type things, and yet we per, we persevere. So, but anyways, Doctor Quinn, go ahead. Sorry. Um, what what were we talking about? I don't know. We're, we're just kind of going that. along as we go. I, okay, I can point out that um, one one thing that, to keep in mind is that when um, when discussing the the validity of anything historical, whether it's a religious or a non-religious text. Um, typically what um, scholars in that and their respective fields use is not the scientific method but the because it has to, to be to to use a scientific method it has to be observable measurable and repeatable you can't do you can't scientifically prove that George Washington was our first president but we know like no one would deny it it's a known established fact what you use is the evidentiary method which I think has four criteria, and it's like, is it historically accurate? Is it internally consistent, the document in question? Um, uh, maybe Dr. Griffith can help me out with the other two, but I used to know them. Uh, just I the historicity them. And, and the internal consistency. It's all, it's what historians Yeah, internal consistency is big in history, use. isn't it? Is, is it is is it cohesive with other documents? And if it's not, you say, okay, well, let's go evaluate these until you sort of um, develop a, a more cohesive picture that comports with uh, uh, what we believe to be an accurate picture of reality of that time period or that event or whatnot. And so and, we, and, yeah. yeah, and so I'm that's sorry. just. And most Sorry, you got a little delay here. Uh, go let uh, Dr. Kroon first, and I'll turn it over to you. Sorry, sorry. I'm just saying. I, She's I so excited. See this? The Dr. Kroon is that um, most scientists don't work with data points that lie to them, um, especially for a purpose. Yeah, that's that, that's a good point. Their 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 objectivity on their data is a lot better because, of course, you know they're looking at, at their data. They're not looking at people's writings of historical events, accountings of events, right, which could be clearly incorrect. And that's a, that's a good point, though, when it comes to like an epistemological approach for like knowledge of how we know something. Uh, you know, I would think that Dr. Ross would say that, uh, I, I assume that he uses like justified true belief for knowledge, but he could use whatever theory. But when it comes to like history, how, how do we justify things like saying we know that George Washington was a real person? I mean, are we ever justified uh, to say that as knowledge? And I think there are theories of knowledge that allow us to do that. But <laughs> Well, I think we need to have a little broader definition of the scientific method because, you know, people outside of astronomy True. and paleontology, for example, insist it's got to be repeatable in the laboratory. But as astronomers, we argue for a broader definition of repeatability. Okay, can we look at other galaxies, look at other stars and see if we get the same effect? So there's different ways of repeating uh, your experiment. It doesn't have to be on a laboratory bench. And uh, I think that would work in, in history as well, is, uh, you know, if you're trying to establish whether or not George Washington did what he did, well, let's look at his contemporaries and see what we know about them is consistent what we understand about his story. So, and likewise with the historical events that are recorded in the different uh, ancient books of the world, there are ways of putting to the test, not necessarily the way some scientists would define it to be. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think there's a distinct difference between uh, observational science and experimental science. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I would definitely put astronomy and astrophysics under the observational science rather than experimental, although they do experiments. But like you said, there's one-time events, so supernova goes boom. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to be able to, to, to uh, repeat any experiment with that particular... Um, well, here's another point that I think is significant. You know you're really on the pathway to a true model in science when you've got the experiments, the observations, and the theory all cohering. And so, for example, in astronomy, uh, we'll be looking at these stars, but we're also doing laboratory experiments to see if the spectral lines we're seeing in these stars are consistent with what we're deducing from our observations. So experiments do play a role. Lab experiments sure. are a critical component of astrophysics, and also the theory. There are people that only do theoretical work, uh, but their theory is always checked by both observations and experiments. And if I could add, add a word of criticism, sometimes when you get into, say, uh, population genetics uh, or genomics, there is an over-dependence on the theoretical analysis of the genome uh, where we're not really looking at field experiments and we're not looking at the observations uh, and not really integrating. Now, I would argue it's much more difficult to do uh, with uh, fossils 
and genomes than it is with stars and galaxies. I would argue we need to do that hard work of trying to build not only a good theoretical model, but finding ways to test it with experiments and observations and looking for consistency amongst the experiments and observations. So I would argue, for example, uh, conservation biology field studies are a critical component of what we're trying to do with genomics. No, I, I definitely, I, I see what you're saying with that. I, I, two minor things is, is one, when I talk about observational, uh, it's like you can't put a star in a jar and measure you know, inside the laboratory, right? So I, when I'm talking about experimental things, I'm talk, talking things that you can actually do in the laboratory. Um, and, and we are observing something, and then we're doing experiments based upon that observation. That's kind of how I look at it. There might be different ways of looking at it, philosophically speaking. I know Dr. Kroon does some amazing astrophotography. If you guys wanted to do, go check out his channel, go check it out. He's He's got it on point of how to do do photographs of stars and nebula. And it's just, it's gorgeous. Matter of fact, I hope his, his channel blows up really yeah, soon because he spends a lot of time know, doing can't it can't put a star in a jar yeah but we can explode a hydrogen bomb and stars are basically gigantic hydrogen bombs well that's that's that, that, that okay fair enough but that's that we also uh, okay, i'm a scientific and a realist so to me we, we 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 say stars are based on these things and i think that's the way it actually is but you know we still can't take that star and and put it in an actual laboratory and go, okay this is actually what's happening with the proton proton cycles or cno reactions now Again, I mean, I'm not saying that's not the way it we is. Can it most certainly the, is. But... With the neutron observations, the the flux, uh, a neutron, no, sorry, neutrino flux observations of the three different flavors of of, of the neutrino family. Well, that's how we would verify the re the reactions by looking at the you, types of neutrinos, you, right? Yeah, you can gather the evidence to support the the nuclear um, synthesis theory of stellar evolution. Yeah. Yeah, though that's what that's what I'm saying. Though we what we do is we observe, and then that supports our hypothesis or theories. Because this is, I still think that is an observational science. Do you, do you guys put uh, astrophysics under observational, experimental, or I think Dr. Ross was kind of advocating both. Well, I just like the example Dr. Kroon brought out is that we're talking the interiors of stars. That's an excellent example where we're integrating theoretical astrophysics uh, with experiments with actual observations and you know it's stunning just the detail to which we can understand the interiors of stars because of the successful integration of those three independent approaches yeah and somebody in the live chat noted this um my friend brian stevens he said uh except if we get nuclear fusion going we'll have a star in a jar but i think that's really not the same thing uh, as far as actually taking the star and then putting yeah. it in, in, in the jar right i mean yes we're, we're doing something that is based upon the same principles as what the star is doing but we're still relating it, saying this is what's happening in the in the lab, and then this is what's happening out there. We're not able to take what's out there and actually put it in a in a controlled environment where we can observe it. This is this is how I'm looking at it. I think it really comes down to how you define um, experimental uh, physics, because I think we're all clear on the observational part, and um, we we agree that there are some aspects of of either in, in any given field, if, if you look for it in the right place. But experimental, I mean, is the Large Hadron Collider an experimental particle physics probe? Yeah, but no one ever touches those particles or interacts with them directly, only indirectly through fields and stuff. And hey, then they control those fields and stuff. So I guess by transit of property, like where do you, where do you draw that line, Steve? Well, you know, we might go in that rabbit holes, but this is what I generally do around here. But uh, I'm okay with that. But I'll ask you guys, I, I think kind of everything's based upon a field in some way. I mean, without the Higgs field, you wouldn't be able to have anything that parts mass. And everything to me, is some, somehow, existence itself is somehow based upon fields. Uh, do you guys have, mm -hmm. a, a, that is philosophy of science, but how would you weigh on that? I have Dr. Roscoe first, and then uh, Dr. Griffith, and then Dr. Kroon, but... Is, is, does that maybe make sense to say that, that like everything's kind of based upon fields? All based upon fields. It's all based upon the four fundamental forces of physics and the space-time dimensions that make up the universe. Yeah, all that's crucial. Do, do you want to like kind of really quickly uh, explain what, maybe what a field is and like the, the, the critical importance of the Higgs field and how that was actually validated with the Higgs boson? Well, I think another key point is the constancy of physics. The fact that physics hasn't changed throughout the entire history of the universe. This is really what makes the discipline of astronomy possible. It's also something we can directly test. 
uh, we can measure the laws of physics billions of light years away, which means we're seeing them billions of years ago. And, uh, you know, they do measure to be exactly the same as we measure in the lab, which really means we can trust what we're seeing in the record of nature. And likewise, we can understand that, uh, you know, fields are important, gravitational fields, the Higgs field's important. These are things we can experimentally verify, not just in the lab, but everywhere in the universe and everywhere back in time. Now, real quick before I get to Dr. Griffith, um, there's still, again, philosophy of science involved here that we are making the axiomatic assumption that these laws have not changed. We cannot validate that either way. I happen to take that foundationally. Um, oh, I, I think we can validate Oh, you think so? Oh, this. Oh, see, I would love to, before I get to, back, uh, to Dr. Griffith, can, can we explore this real quick? Because you, you think that we can actually validate that somehow. Well, I mean, that's something I noticed when I first read the Bible. It says in seven different places, no change in the laws of physics throughout the whole history of the universe. And as an astronomer, this is before I was a Christian, I said, you know, I wonder how, to what degree we can put that to the test. Well, when I, you know, back 40 years ago, we didn't have the testing equipment we have now, but now we can rigorously test uh, the constancy of many different laws of physics to very high precision, literally for the past 13.5 billion years. I mean, uh, the velocity of light, for example, is very easy to test. Uh, at uh, just by looking in different galaxies and stars, particularly the hydrogen line, because it's a hyperfine split line, which means the degree of splitting is proportional to the velocity of light. So we've been able to establish the constancy of the velocity of light, but also the constancy of uh, the gravitational force constant, uh, the ratio of the electron mass to the proton mass, um, and you know particularly the, uh, the fine structure constant. These are all things that are easy to do because of our capacity to look at the spectra of distant stars and galaxies. Okay, um, and, and real quick, if you, I'm gonna turn over to Dr. Griffith real quick. If you turn your volume up a little bit, I guess people can hear, you're audible, but um, it's kind of an no, inequality. Yeah, to yeah, the much better. And, and I, and I, I kind of understand what you're saying. I, I, I do understand these, these terms, but what, what I, I think I might disagree with is that uh, there's a problem there because you, you're still using like induction and there's Hume's problem induction. So we, we cannot justify that use of that. And so we are still assuming that even if we look at the fine structure constant at different parts of the universe and assuming that we have to assume that it has a change, even though we can, we can see in that part of the universe that it, it should be about the same. I, I think there was at one time some discrepancy when we looked in different uh, directions, but I still think there's a uniformity of nature there that we just have to assume because there's no way to justify it because you can't use induction to, to justify induction. But Dr. Griffith, do you want to weigh in on that real quick? Well, uh, the beauty of science and, and something that I really appreciate is the fact that you can minimize those variables. I'm jealous that way because I can't do that when I'm dealing with history. That's why we don't call history a uh, a science. We call it informed by the scientific method. Uh, we call it a craft. Uh, and that's something I, you know, one of these days I want to argue with you, Steve, is the idea of technique. Who, who doesn't want to argue with me? I guess that's the in thing. Hey, let's go argue with Steve on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, telling you, that's like a pot. It's, easy, it's, it's like a sport around here. You're an easy punching bag, Steve. I guess so. <laughs> but, you know, you, you go over and you come right back up. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just dependent upon the field, and I'm, you know, sometimes in awe when people actually trust us, because when you look at a scientific experiment, there's page after page written up of methodology, and page after page of nice raw data, and that can all be gleaned, that can all be observed. When you ask a historian about his or her methodology, you usually get, I look at documents and I try to figure them out. Uh, or, except for me, I listen to radio and television and try to figure it out. Uh, so it's a really different sort of field. Oh, I, I definitely can see that. I, I, and history is not one of my better subjects. Uh, I, I, I took it in college, but uh, I got to tell you, it was really easy because I, I was the only college course in history that I had was, was my history class where he actually gave the exam to you a couple days prior 
of actually <laughs> taking the exam. It was literally the exact exam. I was like, wait a minute, people used to like break into to, to test banks in order to get the copies of the exams. No, he would give it to you and say, here's the exam, go study for it. We'll take it on <laughs> Friday. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh. How bizarre is, what, is that? What was the rationale behind that? Do you know? I guess she just wanted rote memorization and gets to know the topic. But I was coming, you know, I was just getting out of nuke school, and that's not how it is a nuke school. There is like <laughs> nothing like that nuke school. It is you memorize this and then you regurgitate it verbatim, uh, the, the like the next day or something. So that's a completely different way of studying. Okay. But anyways, did you want to add on that, Doctor Kern? Um, yeah, the the first topic before you went on this tangent about uh, what you might call it, it was fields. So I could <laughs> yeah, we start. That. We're going back on fields. Yeah, everything's kind of contingent <laughs> upon fields and, uh, and so more, more, more I, along the lines I, of how do we how do we know that we can rely on these things? How do we? Like I was arguing that the the fundamental concepts of the universe probably haven't changed. Laws of, of, of science haven't changed, but we have to assume that. I, I, to me, I have no other way but to assume it. Doctor Ross would have already argued. He has biblical foundation to say that they won't change, but I think he's predicating that on the belief that God is saying that they, he will not change it. Is that is that well, correct? Well, Steve, I'm actually saying we got the scientific tools to directly measure the laws of physics at different times and places in the universe. Yeah. Therefore, we can actually oh, sure that they've not changed. Uh, we're, it's basically assumption free. Okay, that that might be okay. That might be the case because I you're, you, I guess we can look back in time, so to speak, and see that they at different parts of the universe that they haven't changed, but <clears throat> but we can't say that they won't be the same tomorrow. Not tomorrow, but yeah. we can say that they've been the same okay. for the past thirteen point eight billion years. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. You 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 sh yeah. For for anyone who's a proponent that the laws of the constants of the universe will change, they they would it would be a, a incumbent upon them in my view to provide a reason for the instead of just pulling it out of the air like just randomly change by how much is it a significant amount and by what mechanism why are they changing so you'd have to invoke a whole new theory until you could even take that claim seriously yeah another again i'm glad you brought that up i'm not going to go too down this this rabbit hole but <laughs> dr ross has actually in his long career uh, argued against younger creationism with with a lot of the same people we have, including our good good friend, Doctor Ken Hoven and Doctor. Um, but uh, but one of the things that a lot of the young creationists uh, put out there is that like like the speed of light has changed. I know Jason Lyle, Doctor Doctor Lyle puts that out there with this asynchronous light theory kind of stuff, and it's like I don't think he, they ever bother to explain, like you said, what would be the mechanism by which these these fundamental constants have changed because. Dr. Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, but these fundamental constants are integrally related to each other such that they're natural units. If you know a couple of them, you could pretty much derive the rest of them, even if you don't know their values, just because of qual quantitative analysis. That's true for some of them, that so, they okay. are related. And incidentally, uh, Jason Lyle's idea of the velocity of light uh, going at a different uh, velocity towards us, away from us, it's now been disproven by measurements Shocking. of a gravitationally lens supernova eruption. Shocking! I want to get him on. I, I, I have no issue with Dr. Lyle. To be honest with you, I just don't think he really ever gives evidence for what he's promoting. And I think that you're right. I think a lot of things are falsified. But I would love to get his side on things. Um, he's more than welcome to come on. We've had Young Earth Creationists come on here. We had Dr. Uh, uh, um, uh, oh, who, who wrote? Uh, oh man, what's his name? Um, we just had him on the biologist. <laughs> um, he wrote. He wrote. Uh, uh, oh my goodness! I am just drawing a blank here. Somebody remind me in the live chat. They watch my show more than I watch. Who who, who, who do we just have on? Because I have his book here too. But you know, I did debate Jason Lyle, and at that time we didn't have observational evidence that disproved this hypothesis. Today we do. How, how long ago was that? I, mean, I think I remember, but it's been quite a while. It's about two years ago that uh, we had an eruption in a distant galaxy that was gravitationally lensed. And we were actually able to see the eruption at three different times uh, because the signal came to us through three different pathways. And if uh, Lyle's theory was correct, we'd get them all at the same time we didn't. Oh, I, by the way, I was thinking of Nathaniel Jensen. Thank you, Nathaniel Jensen. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Ken Ham knows my channel, and he... he he allows people to come on because he has he's like the gatekeeper right because they are really controlling their narrative which is by the way i'm going to throw this out there this is one thing i do love about reasons to believe they're out there in the public and they're saying come at us with evidence and, and talk and have conversations and they want to explore their own 
beliefs and arguments. And I respect that. That's what the Great Debate community is predicated upon. That's what my channel is predicated on. I love that. But I got to tell you, the other side, like the Young Creationist side, they're not like that as much. I don't know if you guys notice that as much. Well, uh, we've noticed that and we okay. argue that that's not a biblical approach. The Bible encourages us to actually engage people <clears throat> with us and to constantly put our beliefs to the test. And so this idea that we need to protect our belief system, there's no biblical warrant for that. Yeah, I, 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 and, I, and I admire that, I really do. And by the way, with the whole the light thing, is that sounds very similar to like Supernova 1987A where they were able to determine distance because the, the light came from two different times off reflection. Is that something similar to what you're talking about? No, we're actually talking about the supernova eruption coming to us through three different pathways over a period of two years. So we're not talking oh, a wow. second. We're talking a significant passage of time. Mm. And so, yeah, it dramatically refutes the uh, the Lyle hypothesis. And and yeah. has he said anything on it yet? Or, I mean, he's has, not commented he's on it He's not commenting. Yeah, this is, and this is what's bothering me about um, the Young Earth Creationist uh, PhDs. Now, again, I, I don't like to disparage people individually, right? I, I go after concepts. I go after ideas. But it seems to me because I've been doing this a very long time, is that they, they're they not dumb or ignorant people. I mean, I've talked to these not young creationist scientists. They're very intelligent. However, I think they really do go out of their way to skew the data by co severe confirmation bias and, and cherry-picking. And I don't know if that's something deliberate because they have to hold on to their, their, their belief on younger creationism or if they because they have to sign a waiver for it. But do you think, Dr. Ross, that that somehow it, it, it diminishes them as being labeled as a actual credible scientist? Because I personally do. Well, I think the problem is that they view the age of the earth and the universe as a critical Christian doctrine that they've argued it should be in the creeds of the church. And notice, it's not in any of the creeds of the church. It's not an essential belief of what you believe about the age of the earth or the universe. And so I believe this younger and older debate will go away overnight once people within the church realize this is not a critical doctrine of the Christian faith or the Bible. But as long as you believe it is, uh, you're not going to give way. And that's why that, that's how I explain the intransigence of my younger friends. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that a lot of them do it because... Uh, they have, if, they, if they, and I'll, I'll turn this over to Dr. Griffith here because I think she might be able to add a lot on this, but I think that they do it because it is a control factor. If they can say, look, if this is a salvational issue that if you do not believe the younger creationist narrative because you, you're denying God if you do that, if you're denying his, his works that God created the works, you know, the earth 6,000 years ago, and they make it a salvational issue, I think it puts more of a fear into people and it leads more of them to want to follow some of these young earth creationists i've seen that happen so i do strongly believe that is the case but dr griffith what is your perspective on that um the christian humanists of the the northern renaissance when they started to get into the textual criticism started looking you know erasmus and his gang started co started comparing the different texts from the different years uh they finally had to come to the conclusion that you need to look at each of these propositions and see is it necessary for salvation or not. Uh, and so by, as you say, Steve, putting it in that camp of this is necessary for the salvation of your soul, then you can't question it. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, exactly. That's exactly. They don't right. want you to question it. This is why I like RTB. They're just the opposite, and I've, and I've dealt with RTB for, for a very long time, and I, that's one thing I really enjoyed. That's why I, I went to the AMP convention, because they want people to question. I, I thought I was going to stand out like a sore thumb. I, I, I honestly thought that I was going to be like, oh, my goodness, these people are going to look at me like a heretic, and I'm just damnable, and, <laughs> and yet everybody was so nice and friendly, and they didn't care whether I was agnostic or atheist or whatever you want to label it. They were only interested in having a discussion, and that's what I enjoy. Yeah. And by the way, there was actually a younger creationist there that actually had a great, I had a great discussion with. Um, that was a doctor, uh, he was from SES, uh, maybe uh, Hugh can probably remind me, he was, he was doctor, um, I'm terrible with names lately. Um, do, do, do... Yeah, there were two younger creationist leaders that were at the conference, uh, but both of them uh, did not see this as a salvation issue. Oh, really? So okay, they, so that's they, good. 
Yeah, they were much more willing to engage us and engage us in a way where their emotions weren't getting in the way. Yeah, I, 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 none of them ever were like preaching kind of thing because I got to tell you, the preaching aspect of these things tends to turn people off a lot of times, and I, and I, I'm the same way. I don't like to be preached at, right? And if somebody comes at me like, if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. I'm automatically putting them in the category of this person I'm not going to have a conversation with for very long because that's not how you approach a reasonable dialogue. Uh, I think that the approach is if you if you do believe these things and you think that is salvational, you want to do everything in your power not to have the entrenchment effect. You want to do everything in your power to have that person continue a dialogue with you. And this argumenting mad baculum doesn't work. It, 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 I find it to have the complete opposite effect. Well, what I see in a lot of my young Earth friends is that uh, they treat the scientific community as an enemy to be destroyed rather than a mission field to be won. Oh, I, I agreed. If you look at them as a mission field, you're going to want to engage them. And hey, if you read the Bible, I mean, we're to reach all people groups. You're not to, you know, basically bar anyone. And so, but I think the young earth creationism, what you notice is it really got its start early in the 20th century. And that was a time when fundamentalist Christians were being embarrassed by the scientific community. So I think part of their motivation is to strike back. But I would argue that's not uh, consistent with what the Bible teaches. Yeah, Dr. Kern, do you want to weigh on that? Because I, I happen to think that's absolutely spot on. I think that they do strike back on it. And I think that they have to have the narrative, especially on the creationists, because clearly they don't have the science behind them. I mean... Uh, it, it, I put young creation as just marginally higher than flat earth. I mean, the, the science is just telling everybody that it, they are wrong. It's, it's, I don't think, I, I know there's not a debate they had on that. But do you also think that, that maybe they are giving pushback because, it, because they don't have the evidence, they have to try to, to show that science is somehow evil or malif, um, you know, uh, malignant and, and it's some cancerous thing that if you become a scientist, you don't, you're going to be away from God. Because I've actually seen on churches <laughs> Where it says, you know, something along the lines of, you know, the more you learn about science, the, the further away you come, you get from God, kind of thing, which I think is the antithesis of what a deity would want if he's the creator of science and wants us to understand and have reason and logic. That makes no sense to me. But <laughs> what do you think, Dr. Kurt? Yeah, I agree with you and Dr. Ross. Um, it's uh, it's unfortunate because they they seem to be. Um, uh, purporting a, a highly skewed, inaccurate representation of, of both doctrines, uh, the, the Bible and science. So it's, it's, it's like they're wrong on, on both fronts. <laughs> and uh, they're just sort of sticking to this, they're just sticking to this idea that A, is, appears nowhere in the Bible, ever. It's only their misinterpretation of it and this like perceived notion that somehow um, they're they're under attack by science, and so they they fabricate this narrative that on the surface, uh, to maybe a not very astute observer, seems cohesive, but to anyone who knows the basics of both doctrines would know that, that it does not mesh with either one even slightly. And, 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 and so it's, it's unfortunate because it gives. Um, you know, other other religious and intelligent and religious, scientifically minded people, it's sort of a bad name. And whenever the religious part comes out, it's like, oh, they just sort of like associate it. It's like you're being judged just in their mind, like, oh, you must be like a creationist, and so it could be um, negatively reflected on those individuals. And it's unfortunate because it's not it's not true at all um, outside of the young earth creationist group. Yeah, I think it's notable that credit for one thing. But uh, years ago, we had the Institute of Creation Research uh, do the rate study. Oh, yes. Oh. And what they said explicitly in that rate study, if the laws of physics don't change, both the Earth and the universe must be billions of years old. Mm -hmm. And the irony of that concession, the Bible teaches that doctrine that the laws of physics don't change. Yeah. yeah, it's it's so funny you mentioned that because first of all, it's 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 I like the fact that we all have different perspectives and different philosophies. Yet we all agree that we think young creations gets it wrong biblically and scientifically. I think Dr. Griffiths, as a historian, probably could touch more on the biblical aspect of that. But uh, you, you know, it's funny you mentioned rates too. Is uh, I think I mentioned it before I was mentioned by Dr. Humphreys in the Journal of Creation about the rate study because we had episodes with Dr. Hankey and Dr. Um, uh, Lachelle or Lachey, on the helium diffusion rates, which were f like four hours, two times, or like eight hours worth of content. Uh, it was brilliant. 
And we asked Dr. Humphreys for his rebuttal. Uh, he was nice enough to actually provide one. He actually wrote to the Journal of Creation. I think it's the uh, 43rd edition, third quarter. And he noted me, <laughs> and the editor noted me as a, what do they, we, well, I'm trying to think of the word they use, but basically like um, uh, a young earth creationist debunker, skeptic, or something along those lines. But uh, they did respond to it. I, 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 from what I understand, because I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, an expert on that topic, but he didn't really respond to anything that the two doctors that I had on were, were saying about what his work was. So I, I, I don't know if Dr. Humphreys was just trying to, to throw something out there to try to, to convince his, to, you know, the people that actually believe already that we did not de- or they did not debunk the human diffusion rate things or there's some duplicity there. I, I don't know. I don't like going to argue a motive. But it was kind of funny that I was mentioning along with the rates project because I, I, that, that, that concession you said is very telling. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Dr. Humphreys has actually said, and another one actually said that uh, they, cannot, they have yet to solve a couple of problems, one of which is the heat problem with, with the helium diffusion rates and, and some other things. And so if they cannot resolve that, if they cannot find a mechanism to explain that amount of, of energy that they need to account for, billions of years of, of decay within 6,000 years, they have no argument at that point, I don't think. They're just, they're just throwing things out there, but they have no real explanation of it. And they're saying what happened. His, his argument was this, Dr. Ross, and you can tell me what you think of it. Uh, Dr. Humphreys had told me, like, like decay rates must change because it has to be that way because the Earth is 6,000 years old. I'm like, that's begging the question. Have you heard something along those lines? Yes, I have. Uh, I've also noted that they fully concede that they're in trouble on their flood models. <laughs> because during the flood, they've got radiometric decay rates speeding up by factors of uh, literally a billion times. Oh, man. And if it speeds up by a billion times, the water is going to evaporate. All life forms will be exterminated. And, uh, you know, when you read the Bible, it talks about uh, Noah actually surviving the flood event. So what do you do? And they admit that they're, they're, they've are they got an intractable problem, uh, but they think, you know, because the earth has got to be thousands of years old, there's a way out. But we have no, we don't even have a conception of how to solve it. And, you know, as a scientist, if you can't even propose a scenario to explain why things are going the way they're going, you don't have a model. I, I couldn't agree with you more. With a scenario. Absolutely. And, and, and Dr. Kroon is a scientist, as an astrophysicist. How, how much energy are we talking about when we're talking about magnitudes of of decay energy in, in a period of a limited amount of time i mean like the whole mantle would be liquidated i mean i can't imagine how much energy we're talking about and they can't account for that they're just like oh well it has to be that way but we don't know how we're gonna we're gonna posit things like maybe the water changed the decay rates maybe aliens i don't know right i'm not saying it's aliens but it's usually aliens. Well, they actually but. posit things like maybe at that time there is no potassium in our body but you know potassium 40 decays yes We've got a lot of potassium in sure. our body and a lot of them say, well, maybe the water uh, would actually shield uh, I, radiation. I, 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 uh, I don't know how that would work. I mean, in a, in a, 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 water I mean, a pressurized water that. reactor, we use, they use water as the moderator in the cooler. It doesn't have any effect on the decay constant. Now, yeah. theoretically, there, I heard there are some things that maybe decay constants could be changed given some environmental factors, but very minimally. And you also yeah, have things like, the, yeah, and then you have like uh, K capture, which is a very, very small amount, only on certain isotopes. That, that's not going to get you them where they want to go, though. No. Okay. No. Dr. Kroon, do you want to add on that from a scientific point of view, too? Well, yeah, I mean, I would need pencil and paper in about... Uh, oh, I've seen you do that. Don't coffee. do that. We'll be here for like five hours. I, no, I'm not going to do it. I yeah. would need it, uh, but it, you could do... Some I would enjoy it, but... Magnet. We could do Fermi estimation, right? So if you, 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 you consider uh, an isothermal distribution of heat in Earth's core and ignore the fact that we have a mantle and an inner and outer core... Let's just look at the inner and outer core as one homogeneous thermally distributed blob of like iron, cobalt, nickel, some uranium and thorium thrown in there. And that's essentially what's uh, producing the heat. And uh, that and the, and the fact that Earth's size, the volume to surface area ratio makes it so that it traps the heat for longer times, like Mars is frozen and all that. And so if you if you, if you you know the, the, the thermal energy density, like I don't know that offhand, 
and you could model the outer and inner core of some radius. I don't know that radius offhand. You can come up with a, a total energy, like a heat capacity, and then you can look at the energy density of nuclear fission um, and not a runaway fission bomb type, but just the radioactive decay products of uranium. And then it compressed the four and a half billion years and counting, because we still have, and we just had earthquakes in California recently, we've got active volcanism, there's still a lot, a lot more decay energy to be released. And so four and a half billion years plus a lot more compressed into what, uh, overnight or a few weeks or years or even a thousand years, it's gonna, it's gonna not only liquefy the earth and evaporate the oceans, but other, other nuclei that haven't yet emitted their energy yet are going to be completely like photo disintegrated by the ones nearby so it's going to be such a violent explosive event it would almost be like an entire nuclear bomb yeah i think they call that an everyone dies scenario and everyone dies yeah i mean it, it is so funny when people hypothesize things that end up being like that and they do so with a straight face it's like saying well yeah we got a cure for cancer uh just take this poison you'll die but you won't have your cancer <laughs> okay that's not really a cure people <laughs> i don't get that <laughs> Now, real quick, before we go any much further, just to let you guys know we are we're kind of approaching the hour mark. We're going to go about 90 minutes. I do want to send some Q&A in, but I want you guys to, to kind of continue on the lines because I think this is – this. I love these types of discussions, especially when I relate philosophy and science, two of my favorite subjects. All right, I do have a super chat from a, from a dear friend who I adore, and uh, she asked a question that's kind of uh, tangentially related, but I, 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 I love her. So this is for Sarah. She says, does Dr. Ross still think there is experimental evidence for string theory? Excuse me. I do think there's strong experimental evidence uh, that we have six tiny dimensions of space that accompany the three large ones, of which string theory is a subset. A lot of people think that uh, only string theory fits in with that nine spatial dimensional construct. That's not the case. String theory's got lots of competition. But I think, uh, you know, my friends at Caltech made a very strong case that the only way you can have uh, all the symmetries required by quantum mechanics, relativity, and gravity is if there's six extremely tiny space dimensions that accompany the three large ones, uh, of which uh, the six tiny ones stopped expanding at the Planck moment. So I think that part is secure. Whether string theory is the answer, uh, we don't know. Uh, one of the wonderful things that's happened in astrophysics is thanks to our observations of quasars and blazars, we no longer have 10 to the 500 viable string theory models. The number has shrunk significantly below that, but it's still a huge number. Yeah, so we're talking about compactification in these types of space times. By the way, I read uh, Who's Afraid of the Multiverse um, by Dr. I, I hate pronouncing his last name. I, I, Swearing. I, Swearing, yeah, Swearing. But I, I always, I, for some reason, I always get it wrong. But, but Dr. Swearing, great book, by the way. If people want to go, it's a very small book. I mean, most, a lot of these RT books are pretty small, more like pamphlets, but they're very informative. And I got to tell you that that book, for, for people that have never looked into like the multiverse, was a very, very basic, well written uh, explanation of how people can conceptualize level one multiverse, level two multiverse, level three. And I think from there, you can start getting into string theory and trying to understand how these space old dimensions are compactified. And as soon as you get like, I don't know, like 10 dimensions, you're literally having any possible thing whatsoever. This is where I just, my brain stops processing because string theory is way beyond anything I ever hope to get into. I would like to get Dr. Suskin in here one day. We do have a mutual friend that we're working on. Uh, hopefully in one day, because uh, I, I, I also have his book here, the, the uh, uh, oh, uh, String Theory. It's um, the landscape, the, um, what's it? Again, I'm just having a heck of a time today. What is it called? The, uh, uh, the fabric? No, the, his, his book on String Theory. The, it's not the moral landscape. That's uh, Harris. Uh, somebody, you know what? This is why I have a smart audience. They'll, they'll eventually tell me on this. But, uh, uh uh, but yeah, so I, I agree with Dr. Ross in that I, I'm not a big proponent of string theory, but it's just a working high mathematical hypothesis the way I look at it. But I don't know that much about it. Is how theoretical physicists have been able to look at, you know, universes uh, with 26 space dimensions all the way down to just three space dimensions. They're able to figure out, hey, the answer has got to be nine. Nine. So they're able to eliminate all the other possibilities. 
<laughs> yeah, that still leaves a lot of theoretical room open for for speculation and work. Yeah, I think it's it's called the cosmic landscape, by the way. I don't know why I didn't, but he but yeah, he posits like t he posits uh, ten to the five hundred like multiverses or, or different landscapes out there. Ten to the five hundred based on string theory. Now that's only based on I think. Is it nine spatial, one temporal dimension, or is it just not nine dimensions? Yeah, nine spatial, one temporal. Okay. But thanks to our observations of quasars and blazars, it's no longer as high as ten to the five hundred. It's a much lower number See, than that. See, I, I I kid that I don't read, but I do read every so often. Um, but uh, somebody asked YouTube Super General asks uh, like a book for layman. Yeah, uh, I think they're the RT book books. Most of them are designed or written so the average person can try to understand it. Uh, but they don't. They don't shirk on the science. Like I, I had Dr. Fuzzrana, which, by the way, will be with us next week. And what, that's actually the reason we're doing this today. Dr. Fuzzrana want to talk about the subject um, on uh, next week, on the, I think it was the 15th. And yet Dr. Hugh wasn't available at the time, so we brought him in to get his perspective on this. So we're going to have Dr. Uh, Fuzzrana, uh, my friend from Reasons to Believe, next week. But I, he sent me the book, uh, Dinosaur Age, or the Age, uh, Dinosaur Blood and the Age of the Earth. And again, very small, but very telling um i actually had read Sw dr Schweitzer's work and i had her on and he he just basically had the too long didn't read version of her work and i thought it was great so if somebody wants to to have a really basic understanding of, of these topics these little pamphlets they're pretty good i gotta admit yeah rtb does a good job of that many editors on our staff as we have scientists and our editorial team their job is to translate the science for the lay reader but not to compromise the science. They do. I, I, I will tell you in my personal lay person experience, because this is the audience that it's, it's for, I think they do an amazing job of that because I know a little bit about science and I happen to be a huge lay person. I am the reader that I think these books are kind of geared to, are they not? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so if, if, if I review them and I say they're pretty good, I'm giving my objective opinion on that. Of course, it's still my subjective opinion, but I'm trying to be objective. Though the rules words are inter so misused in, in science and philosophy. But do you guys want to start taking some questions after you guys kind of may wrap up what you think about the philosophy of science or you just want to go into a Q&A? Because I know I want to keep this down to less than 90 minutes because it's easily digested to people watching this after the, the fact, after the live feed. Griffith's got to say. She, oh, oh, we could spend five wow. hours listening to her. <laughs> She's my fa one of my favorite people on YouTube. You don't even know. I, I can just sit back and just enjoy her talking or reading a phone book. I don't care. <laughs> well, my... Um, my approach, my, my question that I've been thinking about the, the scientific method and the laws of physics and, and even getting down to logic, are, they, are these laws, these rules, these um, ideas prescriptive or descriptive? Uh, are they, are, are they <coughs> predetermined by what we come along and, and uh, that, that we're here? Or are we as humans trying to just feel our way around in the dark? That would be my my big question about the uh, philosophy of science. Right. Do you, and do you guys want to, uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Kuhn, you want, to, you want to try to answer that? I have my own perspective on that as well. We don't but. think it's either or. We think it's both and. And uh, I think one way we can put the scientific method to the test, how productive is the scientific method relative to other interpretive tools for investigating the record of nature? And that's where I think the scientific method really shines. It's head and shoulders above every other interpretive method in helping us make progress in understanding the record of nature. D Dr. Kroon? Yeah, I think um, the scientific method is the, the best tool we have to subtract the human from the scientist so that we can filter out our, 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 our biases and our preconceived notions and, and all, all, the, all that that comes with the human mind, which are great for, for a lot of things, but, but not obviously for trying to figure out the way the world actually works. Uh, electrodynamics, uh, nuclear physics, particle physics, uh, meteorology, uh, biology, chemistry, everything, not just physics, which I, I also believe physics is essentially the, this the most fundamental. They say that uh, biology is applied chemistry and chemistry is applied quantum mechanics really and quantum mechanics is one of the, the major pillars of modern physics uh, at the bedrock. But I believe the scientific method definitely does a good job and has been doing a good job throughout um, history 
uh, especially in, in, in the modern ages in the last century or so. However, there, uh, I, I do think one problem, uh, and this is almost tangentially related, uh, there is a growing concern of academia as a business and how uh, what is published um, might not be the most fair way to select papers to be published. I'm all for peer review and critical analysis before publishing something, but a lot of, uh, I've, I've seen, I've seen a lot of um, sort of idiosyncrasies of the, 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 the world of academia when it comes to, to publications that leaves a little to be desired. And that kind of is a whole nother discussion, but that's just, uh, I wonder, perhaps either of you other folks may have seen this sort of going on behind the scenes. It's hard to get published, it's hard to get funding. Um, again, for good reasons, but maybe it's uh, unintentionally a disservice to ferreting out the, the ultimate nature of, of, of reality and, and their respective scopes of uh, whichever proposal is being applied for. I think it's unfair towards the independent researchers because the cost of getting publishing is getting to be more and more prohibitive. Yeah. I mean, a hundred years ago, it didn't cost you a lot of money to have a peer reviewed paper published in a respected journal. Not the case anymore. And I notice a lot of journals are saying, hey, if you want it to be open access, give us a lot more money. Yeah, yeah. I think there's uh, there's pros and cons. Um, I, I, that's a whole different episode, by the way. Having yeah. open <laughs> access and people publishing stuff, and and whether you know we have a a, a, a a problem with with these papers being one time experiments, and there's no repeatability, so the repeatability problem. Um, are they being fact checked? Are they? And and, and of course, we ha I think that the peer review process is the best way we can go. I don't know how else we would do it. Does it have issues? Yes. Do I think those issues are being exploited by by people then saying, "Oh well, you know, we shouldn't have the peer review process," or you know, science isn't always correct? And I think they exploit it for their own narrative, but it's still the, the best way to go. But you're right. Uh, I think uh, the the people that are trying to publish, and I talk to people that do write a lot of stuff, it is not an easy process, is it? Hmm. Right. I would never write a book because I would. First of all, I have nothing to add to a book, but uh, it it would be it would be very difficult for me as a, a pure layperson with no credentials, no access to any kind of um, publisher or anything like that, to actually get a book out. So when people do, I'm amazed by it. I really think that they have put a lot of effort into actually doing it. Um, real quick, excuse <clears throat> me. I have a fifty dollar Australian super chat from Aussie Globehead, our friend Aussie Globehead. Uh, he says NASA said I can say this, or no, excuse me, NASA said I can send this. We, I don't know if Dr. Ross knows, but we are all NASA Illuminati shills, and so we have to, like, clarify and, and run everything we have through NASA because reasons, according to Flat Earthers. So, so <laughs> Australia is a hoax because uh, Australia is one of the thousands of things that destroy the Flat Earth. Yeah, I, I you know, Dr. Ross, when's the last time you engaged with a Flat Earther, by the way? I, I get them all the time on my Facebook page. <laughs> oh. My heart I goes out to you. Them, why don't you buy a, an airplane ticket from Athens to Johannesburg? Make sure you get a window seat at night. Look out the window and watch the constellations slowly turn upside down. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. that's one of the most uh, strongest evidences that we live on a spherical Earth. Oh, yeah. Or, or the moon as well. Because, I mean, if you're on the southern the hemisphere. Is, yeah. What? When you look up and you see the moon upside down, there's just that would freak like me it. out. Actually, I've been to Australia, but I I don't remember doing any kind of observations. But uh, that would really trip me out. I think that'd be like walking outside and seeing like Polaris, you know, rising in the west or something. <laughs> I'd be like, what's going on here? Or, or looking due due uh, north and seeing Jupiter just over the horizon or something. I mean, I well, don't think this is the way it's supposed to be oriented. Is to watch the constellation Orion turn upside down because you know. Yeah. It's yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. In Australia, he's on his head. Right. Yeah. Well, we have a running joke that the Austra there's a couple of running jokes that they, they say that one, the Australians are actually just British people being paid to, to fake a, an Australian <laughs> accent. I, I love that one. And the other one is that they're actually hanging upside down with these what's called uh, safety harnesses. So if they they're, they all like hanging on for dear life, and if they happen to have what's called spontaneous harness failure, they're all going to fall into the sun and die. So we have to check with our Aussie friends every so often, like Aussie Globehead and and Red Eye, to make sure that they haven't suffered from that that debilitating death <laughs> deadly condition known as spontaneous fa uh, harness failure. So 
Although, although it does get a little bit embarrassing and, and a bit R-rated when you ask Australians because one of their slangs for a safety harness is called a strap-on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cander, we have some questions from the audience, so I'm going to kind of turn it over that real quick. But Cander Man says, can you ask Dr. Ross to address the common claim, quote, a miracle is always the least plausible explanation? I think it's important to understand that uh, the Bible claims that God performs kind of a, a tool chest of miracles. Not all miracles are violations of the laws of physics. In fact, only a few that you see in the Bible come into that category, like God creating the universe, including the space-time dimensions. That's obviously a miracle from beyond the laws of physics. But the vast majority of times in the Old and New Testament, you see descriptions of miracles within the laws of physics. And these would be miracles similar to uh, what we would do in making an automobile engine from iron ore. I mean, it basically takes an intelligent agency to manipulate that iron ore uh, to make an automobile engine. It's not going to happen by an uninterrupted natural process. And I refer to those as transformational miracles to distinguish them from transcendent miracles. Uh, like uh, Jesus walking on top of the water of the Sea of Galilee or creating our universe of space, time, matter, and energy. But in the book of Colossians, it talks about sustaining miracles uh, where you God, have God operating in continual way to make sure that the atoms and the molecules don't fall apart. You know, in any particle physicist that actually gets into the study of atoms and molecules, you see this incredible fine-tuning uh, particularly of the quantum uncertainty in order to make sure that atoms and molecules don't fall apart. And so uh, do we have the capacity to test for these miracles? I think we do. I think we've got the capacity to test for all three kinds. Hmm. Uh, you know what? I'm going to kind of toss that to either Dr. Griffith or Dr. Kroon because I'm not quite sure how that would work per se. I, 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 there's two different ways you look at uh, the, the, the God sustaining the universe. You can look at it from a classical theism point of view, or you can look from a more of a theistic personalism point of view, where he's like the great demurge and he's sustaining the cosmos external to himself rather than somehow being intricately related with the universe. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it makes sense to me, ontologically speaking, to think of a deity that is all the time just maintaining the universe through sheer will or something because if he's if he's this and like an infinite power i i don't know how why would you he have to sustain anything it just exists or doesn't exist but do you think that if god exists that he's like like constantly sustaining the universe such that if he disappeared the universe would go with him the universe would go with him it also says every life form would breathe its last breath and die so and that that actually helps me in my scientific research just that biblical perspective that there's something special about everything being so sensitively fine-tuned that if someone wasn't actually continually controlling it, it would fall, fall apart. <laughs> Therefore, I look for that fine-tuning. And the more I look, the more I find. So I think there's actually something to that principle. Do we understand it all? No. Okay. Uh, can we prove it to uh, the nth degree? No. But it does seem to be a pathway for discovering more truth about the realm of nature. So so if Nietzsche was right and God was dead, we wouldn't be here. So, uh, but, uh, <laughs> by the way, that's not really what it means. But, but Dr. Griffith, it, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there. Maybe you can you can run with it. If there's a, a omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing God, couldn't he just create a machine that sustains the universe for him? He, he doesn't have to put any thought into it anymore? Or any work into it? Because I mean, if, he's, if he's divinely simplistic and he, he's just eternal and all this other powerful, is he really doing any work? I mean, first of all, you can relate it to thermodynamics works too. But I, I, to me, it just seems like I, I don't understand the concept of a, a, of a being like this constantly sustaining the universe such that if he, for some reason, didn't exist, that the universe would somehow go along with him. Do you want to add on that? Uh all I would really add on that is, is uh, in just thinking off the top of my head, the craftsman, the greatest craftsman, are the, is the one who has to do the least amount of effort in order to make the most beautiful, wonderful object. Uh, and so that's how I would see it if I wanted to approach that 
that subject is that uh, if there is an infinite being and he's the craftsman of the universe, then obviously he's uh, done things in such a way that he does not have to worry about them. Yeah, I would agree with that in the sense that uh, when you look at the way uh, the life forms are on Earth, they're designed in such a way that they can adapt to changes in their environment. And so, and from a biblical creation perspective, that's the most efficient way to create creatures where this God doesn't have to intervene all the time to maintain things. However, as a cosmologist, I mean, I kind of, some of my friends actually hold to what's called the ekpyrotic Big Bang model, which is the idea that the universe is a 10 dimensional flat sheet, but at a distance so far that we can't see, it actually folds in on itself. And so that we have one part of that sheet, uh, less than a millimeter above the bottom part of that sheet. And if that's the case, in order to keep the universe stable, somebody's got to make sure that a quantum space-time fluctuation of the top sheet doesn't make contact with the bottom sheet. Now, is that the way it really is? We don't know. Uh, but it would be consistent with that biblical principle that there's this God here who's kind of holding it all together in a continual way. Uh, I'm just making the point, I think this is a, an idea that's worth pursuing in certain disciplines of science. But I do agree with you because the Bible actually teaches us that God creates in the most efficient way. It also says that we humans are in the image of God and that the way we design reflects the way God designs. And that's how we design things. We design things in such a way that our maintenance is minimal. Dr. Kern, do you want to add on that quick? And by the way, uh, people are asking for your links. I'm putting the links in the video description as we speak, so that will be done when this actually when it renders, which probably takes about a half hour after we're done. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Steve, I think that um, it makes more sense that God would have made the laws of physics sort of uh, self-sustaining, like he doesn't have to like push the planets around the sun all the time. Like before Ptolemy, they thought like God was like, yeah literally like pushing them around but um, that's a very puny and small god in my view uh and inaccurate i think it would be make more sense that he's uh, a sovereign and that uh, as infinitely more intelligent that than we could even comprehend and would uh, devise a universe in a way that um at least after um a certain point in time he could just chill and everything keeps going. Uh, Dr. Ross, you might recall at um, towards the end of chapter one in, in Genesis, it says, and God rested. And so in the first six days he was making, he was interacting, and um, some scholars, biblical scholars even suggested that if you were to go back in, in space time from right now and watch like this unfolding s most of it will look reasonably like how it is now like galaxies merging and stars blowing up but there might be some subtle aspect of it that would look strange um and as god uh, in fact that the only name of god in ancient hebrew in chapter one of genesis that's mentioned as the only name given for god in hebrew in the whole bible is called uh, is elohim meaning God has made manifest in nature. And so that, I think, is very interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I always remember this quote. I don't remember who said it, but um, somewhere I read, uh, they said, a miracle is something that seems impossible, but happens anyway. And I like that word seems because it, it, it sort of belies the point that you have these um, feeble human minds, as smart as some of them may be, and for all the credit we, we could give ourselves and all of our potential, uh, we are, our intellect falls so short of, of, that, of the intellect of, of a God, uh, of God. And so anytime something, anytime there's this, an, an apparent paradox between science and religion, and this is my closing remark, um, it, is, it is a flawed interpretation that is at fault, so long as the both aspect both sides of the coin are cohesive to their own paradigm and not like a, i'm not saying like oh so the flatter the flat the, sorry the younger creationist thing that would be uh demerit in both category and if people ever come up with something that they think um so, uh, supports science and and denigrates uh theism 
then that would mean um, they have the wrong idea about one or both of them. And, that, and that's my view. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you made a really important point about uh, the seventh day, mm. uh, where God ceases uh, from his work in creation, which implies that during the human era, all we're seeing is natural process. God is resting from his work of miraculous interventions, at least at the transcendent and transformational level. But that also implies that we should see a difference in the realm of biology between what we observe in the human era and what we observe in the pre-human era. Because for six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops. And so that's a key component of our creation model of reasons to believe, is that there's going to be a distinct difference from what we see during the human era when God's not intervening and what we're going to see during the pre-human era when God has been intervening. And so we actually look at paleontology and uh, molecular clocks and other ways of investigating uh, the past history of life uh, to see if there's a difference between the present era and eras before human beings. I, I I don't even know what to add on that because I, I I kind of agree with all you guys, but yet I still I, I you know what I'm just gonna have to leave it at, at that. We're gonna kind of go into the Q and A because I, I think there's a, there's a consilience between all of us that uh, we all look at things differently from our own individual perspectives and world views. But I think when it comes down to the actual philosophy of science and the things that we hold dear that we all want to find the truth. We all want to find a fundamental understanding of reality. And even though I personally don't think we have access to uh, the fundamental basis of reality, I think that is forever outside of our epistemic limit, I think we never should stop trying. I think we should continue always to try to learn and to gain knowledge. Um, and I think that the four of us have unique perspectives of how to go about doing that. And that's why I love these types of, of discussions and dialogues. Uh, we are kind of approaching the, the 90 minute mark rapidly. So I have included your guys' links in the video descriptions for your YouTube channels. I hope that people go there, not only subscribe, but they also follow you on Twitter. Uh, I, I think that both uh, Dr. Kroon and Dr. Griffith, you have your Twitter on your YouTube as well. I, think. I don't use Twitter. I have an account, but I, I, never, I never. You're not a Twitter. Yeah, you're not a Twitterer. You, you have you you have one. I think I've, I've I seen have it. I an Instagram though. It's physics, nobody does Instagram. No, oh, okay. I'm not pretty enough to do Instagram. Although I have an Instagram account that a fan actually did. I didn't make it, but. Um, so uh, why don't we kind of wrap it up a little bit? Uh, give you guys this final summation of these of, of your perspective on philosophy of science, and then promote your channels and anything that you want to do for your organizations. And I got again. Uh, I, tell Dr. Ross how thrilled I am when you come in. Um, I think that we're going to probably be having a lot more people from Reasons to Believe. There's some other uh, scholars from RTB that I've reached out to that are, really want to come in. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Fuzz next week. Uh, I haven't talked to him in ages, so that would be nice. I didn't get a chance to see him during the AMP convention. And that's the, my only little minor quibble with the AMP is that, that you know, Fuzz was busy at the time, you know, unfortunately. Uh, real quick, I got another super chat, then I'll turn it over to you guys to, to kind of wrap it up. Uh, Sarah B at $5. If I wave my hand, oops, oh, just went off screen. If I wave my hands over a stack of pancakes, does it, it doesn't turn into the body of Elvis. Why does it only work for those who believe in God or Cracker? Um, well, that, some people would argue that it's faith-based, right? If you if you believe enough that God and God will fulfill it, you know, if two or more gather in my name kind of thing. Personally, I don't think, I, I do agree with Dr. Kroon. I just it's the definition or using usage of what a miracle is, uh, but I personally don't think that miracles and science are congruent. Myself, I think that if you posit a miracle, you're just saying we don't have a natural explanation. And the problem with that is that I personally think that science is predicated on finding natural explanations for natural phenomenon. Other people might hear disagree, but that's just how my my view of that is. Argue you can put that to the test because from a, a non-theistic perspective, you're going to have gaps in your models. From a theistic perspective, you're going to have gaps in your models. We're never going to learn everything. But how we can test theistic models versus non-theistic models is what happens to the gaps. Do the gaps get smaller, less numerous, and less problematic? If that's the case, I think you can argue you're on the pathway to truth. But if the gaps get bigger, more numerous, and more problematic, you probably got the wrong model. That's possible. We both have the wrong models. Oh, absolutely. In this case, we invent another model that actually has uh, a better success uh, you know, rate with the gaps. 
And so I think gaps are wondering if people argue about the God of the gaps, there's also the God of the no gaps. Frankly, I welcome gaps. They're a wonderful way uh, by seeing what happens with the gaps as you learn more to figure out what's really going on. Yeah, I, I have no issue with that. The, the God of gaps to me won't be an issue when you say something like, well, we can't explain that, therefore it must be God. That is yeah. a fallacy. But I, that's, that's what I see RTB do, so. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kroon, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to have actually Dr. Griffith lead us out. She does the benedictions for these things. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Kroon, if you want to like promote your channel, Point Blank, and the, uh, talk a little bit, if you will, please, about your astrophotography. Because, man, your, pho your photos are amazing. Uh, I think more people need exposed to it. You're like the res rhetoric of astrophotography. He does rocket launches, and he films them. But you do brilliant, brilliant pictures. Thank you. Yeah, so my YouTube name, tag name, Point Blank, uh, the YouTube channel is John's Astrophotography. I have eight videos up, I think. I image um, from my front yard in the brightly lit city of Fairfax, and sometimes I venture off to darker skies. I just sort of fell into it as sort of natural, as inevitable as rain falling, I guess, with the, the a heart of an astrophysicist sort of, um, you know, exploring the night sky. Um, I, uh, I, I do intend to write a book someday. Um, I have a cool title picked out already. I won't say it here yet because it, it might change. I don't want to jinx it. But my, my whole like mission statement, like what I'm all about, um, I want as many subscribers as possible, not for the reasons that most people on YouTube want subscribers. I want as many subscribers as possible because I want to show as many people in the world as humanly possible the universe through my eyes and I want to uh, I love that public outreach I love uh, spreading enthusiasm and inspiring people and showing that even right here in the brightly lit suburbs and, and uh, of city life you can with the right equipment on a budget even which is going to be part of my book and with the right guidance you can actually get almost Hubble-like views to the cosmos right in your front yard, and it'll change your life. You're going to see a whole new... I mean, people don't look up because then there's nothing to see except for the moon and, like, 10 stars, uh, maybe Jupiter and Venus. But, you know, when there was that blackout in New York and then everyone saw the Milky Way and everyone was calling the cops, they, they were scared, they, they didn't know what it was, they thought it might be UFOs, that's saying something. Okay, <laughs> that's... <laughs> So that's what I'm all about. I, I, I want to I want to go with people on that, that journey of, 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 of astronomy, of astrophotography, of looking at the universe, learning more about uh, the world that's just right over your head. So yeah, that, that's a that's a good segue real quick to a question I have from from our dear friend Pine Creek in the live chat. Uh, he asked a question very similar. You just mentioned UFOs. Uh, and I think it's a, I think it's a good question to ask for uh, and, and probably something we may have a different hangout on, actually. But uh, reading Dr. You know, Ross's uh, books for a while, I mean, he asked the question, if you still think that aliens and demons and UFOs are somehow intricately related from each other, which I think is a very fair question, because in the 80s and 90s, you did posit these things. Is this something that, that you still hold or that RTP holds, or have you somehow modified or changed those kinds of positions? So we still stand by what we wrote okay. in Lights in the Sky and Little <clears throat> Green Men in 2002. Uh, we had some updates. We have done some uh, uh, blogs that uh, update it. But yeah, there's nothing in that book that we would change. Okay. And we uh, argue it's testable. I, w I would actually like to do a full hangout on that one of these days. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I know you're so busy. Your, your schedule's ridiculous. I don't know how you keep up. I could barely do a show every other day. And you're like, every day I talk to Anastasia, and you are like, just, you, you must have a, a schedule like that thick. Yeah, I'm scheduled pretty far out. Yeah, you are. Um, and by the way, my compliments to Anastasia once again. Uh, she's the best PR secretary, whatever her label you want to call her is, that you could possibly ever, ever have. Uh, I think she's amazing. Um, and I thank her very much for all she's done and, and for organizing these things. Um, she's just so on point and professional about it, and I couldn't ask for anything better. Oh, so. you're going to enjoy Fuzzy's just come up with two new books. Oh, uh, I, I think I remember her mentioning one. What's, what's the, do you remember them? Well, Humans 2.0, it's a book on, uh, you know, that's uh, transhumanism. Transhumanism, right. I, that's I one thing you want to talk about. a book on evolution. Awesome. So. Yeah, because, I mean, I do want to get more into the RTB biblical um, understanding of, of clades and phylogeny and special creation, and I think Fuzz would be the perfect person to kind of dive into that with. But anyways, like I said, we are coming to the 90-minute mark, and I, I'm going to keep this 
down to that. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, next week, we will have uh, Fuzz Rana on. Tomorrow, we've got Cheshire and I. We're going to be reviewing the debate between Kent Hoven and Godless Engineer with, uh, I think, Jackson Week and also Bill Ludlow. Uh, man, he has become a superstar. Uh, he debated Kent Hoven on my channel quite a while ago and just propelled himself into superstardom because of it because it was a brilliant discussion the only the only debate against or discussion against dr dr ross or excuse me dr uh, hovind was uh back way back in the wind if you guys haven't checked it out dr ross had a discussion with, with kent that was just brilliant beyond brilliant uh that was on the doctor was it the urban show barnerman show it was on the John Anchorman John Anchorman show. show. Okay, John Anchorman show. Yeah, yeah that, that brought me out at the last minute. I thought it was comedy. It took me a while. You to did research. so stellar. I that that will go down as one of the most all time greatest discussions of all time because I I was sitting there thinking to myself, and maybe you can elucidate a little bit on it before we, we lead out here with Doctor Griffith. But were you taking him seriously, or were you just thinking to yourself, this this guy's got to be out of his freaking mind? Oh, I thought it was comedy because the night before John had us over to his house for dinner. And said, I've chosen the two of you because you both have your reputation for being a gentleman. And when Kent began his rant, I said, well, this has got to be some kind of joke. I'm going to play along, especially since he had 60 toy dinosaurs in front of him. So you, you weren't familiar with him then? Comedy. You, you were not familiar with him at the time? I did not know him. Oh, uh, that, that explains so much. Uh, yeah, because we have the, the gift of hindsight, right? So we're looking back on this going, I can see this, this, this look of distress in your face going, wait a minute. Yeah, what's is, going on is here? He, is he, no, is he, wait, yeah, this, is he serious? No, because everything Ken says is wrong. He has, he has one thing that he gets right all the time, that he's consistently wrong. You know, he's just, he's, that's the only thing you can count on with Kent is that nothing he says, I think, is sensical. Uh, it just... Well, my sons actually show their friends a DVD recording of it for, for comedy purposes. Oh, but like I said, if people haven't checked that out, go check that out on the John Anchorman show. Uh, is that how you pronounce Anchorman? You can, you can watch the whole thing for free. We give you a link for free on our website. There you go. Go to, go to Reasons to Believe. Check it out. I, I got to tell you, one of my favorite discussions of all the time. The other one was uh, during, uh, it was uh, Hugh Laurie. I uh, had a discussion with uh, an archbishop on a Ted, was it, um, uh, uh, was, is, a, is a Catholic church a force for good? Uh, it was a, a, a IQ squared something, if you guys remember. That was a really good discussion. But anyways, Dr. Griffith, I want to thank you for joining us as well. Uh, thank you for your husband to allow you to graciously come on camera with us again and borrow us from him. I know he's very possessive of you as well as he should be. But uh, would you like to lead us out kind of a... Uh, throw your, your, your final comments in and then give your channel for uh, Unsettled History. You have to unmute, by the way. You, you sound better when you're not muted, by the way. No, you're still muted. Okay. There yeah, we go. Okay. Awesome. I'm here. I'm sorry. I didn't want to cough and, and make noise. I know. I, I have a cough myself. I've been trying to mute every time. I think I missed one, but I apologize. So I want to plug my our, our channel first, History Unsettled. Uh, we're working on a concept that we're going to be introducing for the months of July and August, which were, interestingly enough, named after two Roman emperors. We're thinking about doing a whole, at least four episodes or kind of a mini-series on Rome and looking through Rome as a way to interpret history and look at historiography uh, and several different controversies. So that's, that's something that'll be coming up soon and you know, we'll, we'll put the word out when we, when we get stuff done. But I, the one th last thing I wanted to say, uh, Steve, and to the audience, thank you for being here. Thank you, Steve, for, for putting this all together. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Kroon and Dr. Ross for their valuable time because I love to teach my students about scientists because they are people who uh, have a certain amount of curiosity, a lot of creativity, they protect and defend their integrity, but most of all, and I think you will see this quality in both Dr. Kroon and Dr. Ross in gigantic measure, humility. Uh, and this is one thing I have really enjoyed today. So thank you very much for letting me be part of this. And thank you for joining us. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more. By the way, I do correct my errors, which I, I frequently make, but this is why I, this is why I have a smart live chat, because when I make 
faux pas, which is quite frequently on my channel, actually. Uh, they, they're like, hey, Steve, no, you screwed the pooch on that one. So it was actually Stephen Fry, and it was Intelligence Squared. That was the debate. Again, I, I just have a hard time with recollections at my age any longer. So this is, they're, they're like my little pocket brain. So thank you for, for fixing me on that. But uh, anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. The links are in the video description. We'll have Hugh, uh, excuse me, Dr. Fesserada on next week. And I think, uh, Dr. Griffith, you're joining us for that as well? Okay, so yeah. we're going to be having a similar discussion, but we're going to be talking about it with Fuzz's point of view, and I get more, I think, more the biological philosophy of science. With that, guys, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us in the Great Debate community. Uh, link to join in the Great Debate community is in the video description as well. Join us on Facebook, and have a good night. Thank you for watching. Thanks. <laughs>